blessed Easter, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ at PBC, as well as all of us who are tuning in this blessed Easter weekend. Easter Sunday is always a day of joy, and Christians all over the world, we eagerly flock to our sunrise services. Churches are packed, and this Easter 2020, however, is different. Streets are quiet, churches are empty, and from small to large churches, almost everywhere, priests and pastors will look across rows and rows of empty pews. And fear seems to be the prevailing emotion as Christians and non-Christians alike all around the world remain under strict social distancing. Can we relate that emotion to the first Easter Sunday? Because the first reactions to the resurrection were confusion and fear. The Bible records that the guards at the tomb trembled and became like dead men at the sight of the angel. And to the faithful women, the first words spoken by the angel were, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. That is a cry of every Easter Sunday. So let's read Mark chapter 16, verse 1 to 8 for ourselves, as we look into the topic of the power of the new life, as we examine the resurrection of Christ in our series, Discipleship in the Gospels. Mark chapter 16, verse 1 to 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. And very, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, verse 5, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Do not be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that wherever we are today and wherever your children are gathered in worship, Lord, we celebrate Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And we pray that the meditation of our hearts and the words of my lips will be acceptable in your sight as we consider what your Spirit has to say to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A little bit about the background before this. We know 
that Nicodemus on Friday, after Jesus' body was taken down from the cross, he had already applied mirth and aloes, 75 pounds, that's 34 kilograms of spices onto Jesus' body. And the two women at the cross, and they saw that Jesus was buried at the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Now when Sabbath was over, these women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, together with Salome, bought spices so that they can go and anoint the body of Christ. That was their final act of devotion that was on their mind. So that's why very early on sunrise, on that Sunday morning, the first day of the week, the scripture says, they went to the tomb. Now, as the people, uh, the, the, the women, make their way to the tomb, they were concerned about how they can get to the body because the tomb was, in one sense, that a huge stone with Roman guards, you know, co uh, covering over it. They were wondering how can they take away or enter into the tomb. But when they arrived there, they were surprised. Scripture says the, the stone had been rolled away. And when they entered into the tomb, they had an even bigger shock. They saw a young man dressed in a long white robe. And the other Gospels, Luke, Matthew, describes these uh, angels. And they were amazed and alarmed. Fear, wonder, amazement, astonishment, and distress gripped their hearts. The word alarmed is the same word that is used in Mark chapter 14, verse 33, that describes it, that is used to, to describe Jesus' agony, his distress that he experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane. So it was troubling for them. But yet, when we look at this account, we see one thing. Is that the women receive comfort from the Lord. There were two angels at the tomb that day. And two is the number that is required to establish a valid witness of an event. And many of us would remember the Ark of the Covenant. And when God asked Moses to construct the Ark of the Covenant, he gave very specific instruction, including the fact that there are to be two cherubim to be uh, carved out, out of solid gold. And they would be placed at the two ends of the Ark of the Covenant, as you can see. And their wings are supposed to go and touch each other. What a tender a picture, what a picture of tender comfort and care. And I can just imagine, though it's not written in the scriptures, but just imagine when the body of Jesus lay there in the tomb. God is watching over the body of his beloved son. The Bible says in Psalm 16, it says, You will not abandon my soul to Sheol, that's a place of the dead, or let your Holy One see corruption. Psalm 16. And Peter referenced that again. 
when he spoke in Acts chapter 2, verse 27. And the next Psalms, Psalm 17, says, Keep me as an apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from wicked, the wicked people who will do me violence. Are you in a fearful situation at the moment? But whatever you're feeling, whatever you're going through, we must remember and take courage and take comfort that the fact that God is also still watching over you. Matthew and Mark focus on the angel who talked with the women. And he was sensitive to their distress. So he calms them, he assures them by telling them this greatest surprise of all. He says, don't be alarmed. Don't be afraid. Don't be distressed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has been resurrected. He pointed them. He called on the word, Jesus the Nazarene. Spoke to them in a very down-to-earth manner. They are not directed. The women are simple people. They are not directed to say, you must experience something very spiritual. But they say, the angels directed them. Look to the Jesus that you know. The one who died by crucifixion. You have witnessed his death. You have seen that he was buried in this tomb. But today I tell you, he has been resurrected. There is this continuity between the historical Jesus, the one that they know. And it's the same person as the resurrected Jesus. He's not another person. He's not another soul in another body. No. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. This is what we as Christians can take comfort in. God does not change. The one you are to know when Christ comes, is the one you have known. It's the one that you have dedicated your life to. When you make a commitment to say, Jesus, I trust you, I believe you, I surrender my life to you. And every day as you spend time with him, he is the one who is by your side, revealing his heart for you placing his hand of comfort upon you. This is what he's saying. The empty tomb that both received the crucified one and gave up the crucified one became the pulpit where the good news is preached. He has been resurrected. He is risen. He is not here. There is a new normal after the resurrection of Christ. There is a new order of existence. Like what we pe uh, people always say uh, nowadays, after this COVID-19 passes, life would be different. Maybe we can't, you know, we'll be fearful to shake hands with one another. And we'll be hesitant. Every time we go out, we'll be thinking about using a mask there is going to be a new normal. But this new normal for a Christian is that the kingdom of God has come in power. And this is what Jesus had mentioned in Mark chapter 8. When he said to his disciples, anyone who wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. And 
and he carries on and tell them some who are standing here standing in the disciples some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of god has come with power and these women these faithful women who went to the tomb that easter sunday were among the first witnesses the evidence is undeniable the tomb is empty now they have now that they have received comfort from the lord they are now given a new assignment and this is what the, the disciples the the women were told by the angel go tell the disciples tell peter about this good news that jesus has risen and he as what he has said he's go he's gone ahead into galilee and there they will meet him there they'll meet him as if it's not enough Jesus appeared to them shortly after that, after the angels spoke. And then we can read that in Matthew chapter 28, verse 9. He said, Greetings! And as they came to him, they clasped his feet, they worshipped him. Previously, they only saw him as a teacher, as a master, as a lord. But as they see him, resurrected in front of them in the flesh they realize that is no longer an ordinary man here stands before them is the living god and they worship him that's the new normal for them and jesus said to them do not be afraid there it goes again assure them do not be afraid comforted them Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. What an amazing term that Jesus used. No longer servants, but brothers. Anyone who follows Christ, who dedicate their life to Christ, who trusts in his finished work on the cross, God calls us his brothers what do you think the women did with the spices they left it behind there's no need to anoint a dead body that is no longer there i think at this season it is good for us to think about what are some of the so-called dead things unhelpful things that you have been spending your time and energy in. Things that does not produce lasting fruit. What are the dead things that you need to leave behind? And in the same manner, as they receive that new assignment, they are to start proclaiming the good news that Jesus is risen. Their Lord and Saviour has resurrected. He's left the tomb. And a similar question we need to ask. If we leave the dead things behind, what life-giving matters do you need to invest in? Things that are of good and lasting value. Some, I think I believe it is time for us to give serious thought because the time is short. This period that we're going through reminds us that whatever can be shaken will be shaken. We have a taste of what it is like suddenly if, if Christ comes, when Christ comes again, The churches, the pews, will be empty, 
forever. The people of the Lord, God's own people, will be taken up to heaven. We don't want to be ones, the ones to be left behind. So, as we look at this, we want to ask ourselves, where can we start? What do we begin? What can we begin to do today, tomorrow, the next few weeks, even in the short years ahead? And this is what the angel and Jesus said to the women. He says, go and tell his disciples and Peter. Go and talk to them. Why? Not only is that their disciples, but they, I'm sure, would have felt very much dejected. They have failed the Lord. They have ran away. They have denied, like Peter had denied Jesus three times. None was at the cross except for John and the women. So if I were them, surely I would feel, how can I ever see my Lord again? No face is I just, you know, cannot see him face to face. So where do we start to offer the pledge of new beginnings, of new life? I think it's something that we need to examine. It may apply to ourselves. Maybe we have failed in some ways and we, f we may feel that God can never forgive us again. But Resurrection Sunday is a day of hope. We can begin again. God in Christ had washed away our sins. If you confess your sins, He is just, He is faithful, He will remember the cross of Christ. He cannot deny Himself. And He will forgive of us of all our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. He will give us a clean slate to start. So we need to offer the word of grace, forgiveness, hope, promise, whatever is good, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever that can draw and give hope to those with no hope, to those who are fearful, to those who are unsure of what is to come. And even as we look at Matthew, sorry, at Mark, Mark ends at verse 8. It says, The women started running from the tomb. They were overcome with trembling and astonishment. They said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. You know? What a strange way to end the gospel. Did Mark decide to say, maybe I should put something else there? But there, we have it. The rest from verse 9 onwards were added later on. We ask, shouldn't they go back rejoicing that their Lord is, is risen? Is there something unexpected about their response? But if we look at Scripture, we find that this is very consistent. That fear is more than often our initial response to when the breaking in of the power of God. When God breaks into our life, when God's power comes upon, when we have a visitation, if I may use the word, from the Lord. There is always this fear, this reverent fear, this falling down before Him. It is our initial response. It was fear that the disciples 
experience when Jesus stilled the storm. Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? And the people up in Gadarenes or Garasins, the Gentiles, they were fearful when Jesus delivered the demon-infested men and all the demonic spirits, the unclean spirits went into the pigs. We know about that. The legion of them. And they said, Jesus, don't come. Go away. Go away from my, from my place. And even, I believe, the, the disciples also experienced fear when, when Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. He says he was ready to die on the cross. They couldn't understand. When Jesus shows his power, when God shows his majesty, this is the response. This is our response. So Mark, the Gospel of Mark, ends, in one sense, with a cliffhanger, with a sense that the people were stunned, the disciples were stunned, the women did not know what to do. How can they respond? How would they respond to all this good news? How will you respond? to this good news. At Easter, the life change. You read that in the book of Acts, which we will do this. We will study the book of Acts further in the second half of the year. But what I want to say here is that as they experience the resurrection of Christ, they receive the power of a new life. They receive the power of a new life. Knowing the reality and the power of Jesus' resurrection will give you and I a hope in a new life. It literally changes the direction, changes the trajectory, the path of your life. And you no longer need to live in the shadow of your past, but instead you step into the light. You step into the light of God's presence, of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And you are confident of a glorious future with God. There are at least three things that are impacted when you have a, this new life in Christ. Number one, Colossians chapter 3 tells us that this power, this resurrection power that raises up Jesus, it changes our passion. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. It changes our passion. We no longer place a prime priority a high priority on acquiring things just for the sake of acquiring things. But instead, we want to dedicate whatever we have for the glory of God. Our first love is no longer the things of the world. Our first love is a love for Christ. We have a change passion. And even though we may go through dark, stormy times, we remain faithful to worship God. And that's what true worship is. 
Not when things are going just smoothly, when we're surrounded with all the nice cities, the nice things in our sanctuary, you know, nice music, nice aircon, whatever. But it is how we this how we respond to our storms, to our difficulties, it determines just the, the kind of worshippers we are. Are you still able to worship God in spirit and in truth, even in this season? Secondly, we find that we have a changed perspective. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5 onwards, tells us that through this power, this resurrection power, we are made alive. It means that we are alert. We do not slumber. We are alert and we are supposed to be alert spiritually, mentally. And because of the power of Christ, we have this supernatural ability to look at circumstances. Even though times are tough, but we don't look at circumstances with despair. We don't look at circumstances with doom and gloom. But we look at the circumstances from a heavenly perspective. We, as Christians, we don't live in denial. We don't live like the ostrich when there is danger. We bury our head in the sand and say, Hopefully, there's nothing wrong. We recognize danger for what it is. Physical, emotional, and most of all, spiritual danger. We are able to call out things the way that God calls them. You are able to see danger from afar and you take the right prudent steps to avoid it. You prepare for it. And you warn people of the clear and present danger of God's coming judgment. But you also offer people the comfort of God's love, mercy, grace, and kindness that is in Christ. If you read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 7, all this is spelled out there. Because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. God loves you greatly. And He is rich in mercy. He stands ready to offer it to anyone who would call upon the name of Jesus. And this is the important part. When we have a changed perspective, we can be, we remember David Wilkerson in a sermon in 1986. He warned the people, and in, in essence, he warned the world. 1986. He says, I see a plague coming on the world and the bars and church and governments will shut down sounds so much like the condition that we have in today we are in today the plague will hit new york city and new york city today is the epicenter in the u.s the plague will hit new york city and shake it like it has never shaken before. The plague is going to force prayerless believers into radical prayer and into their Bibles. And repentance will be the cry from the man of God in the pulpit. And out of it will come a great third awakening that will sweep America and the world. 1986, 
A man who is close to God. Yes, he has died. He has died tragically in a car accident. But what he said remains recorded. I believe that none of us can ever imagine this can happen in our lifetime. But God's word is faithful. So as we look at this changed perspective, we also remember that we Romans chapter six, verse four tells us that we are raised to live a new manner. There's a new power, there's a new ability to live differently because of our changed passion, because we can see what God is pleased with and what God is not pleased with. And it will enable us to live a life with a changed purity. We will have the power, not of ourselves, but a power given by the Holy Spirit to say no to sin and to say yes to righteousness. Romans 6 verse 4, Paul writes this, Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. May this Easter reminds us of this gift that God has given to us and to exercise that power that the Holy Spirit has given to us. We don't want it to be like a power plug that we know there's power flowing in the, in the uh, wires, but if we are not plugged in, into God and we don't switch it on our devices will never get charged our things will not work so it is something that is important for you and I to continue to rely and to trust in God and especially over the spirit of fear and if we look at the examples of the disciples developing spiritual bonus over the spirit of fear takes time it doesn't just say disappear overnight if we are honest with ourselves we need time to process the angel told the woman don't be afraid and a short time later, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. And then again to the other women. Tell them, don't be afraid. Then he appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus that very day. And later on in the evening, he appeared to the rest of the disciples, the, the apostles. Paul said the twelve, right? And 500 plus others over a period of 40 days before his ascension to heaven. We need time for encounter with the Lord. We need time to process what he's telling us. And sometimes, if, even if we do our feel fearful, I pray that you not be too harsh on yourselves. Or if you, if you sense fear in other Christian brothers and sisters, don't be too judgmental. Don't tell them, you should not be like that. But have the compassion, have the gentleness of Christ to encourage them, to pray with them, maybe to, to share the word of God with them. And that's important for us, my dear brothers and sisters. At this time, we really need to encourage one another. I have been encouraged by the prayers and by the conversations of many of you who called me up, who WhatsApp, yeah, 
And this is something that we pray. And I pray that we'll continue to do for one another. Give each other time to process what we're learning. It's a long distance from the head to the heart. And for us also, we need to have this personal examination. You see, Peter and John, when they heard the news from the women, they rushed to the empty tomb to see for themselves. Thomas, who missed Jesus' appearance that Sunday, he wanted to see the nail marks in Jesus' hands. So it is not wrong to check out the evidence. So read, study your Bible, read beyond it, check history, check archaeology, check science. Truth is truth. It will not contradict the Bible. Exercise your critical thinking. Ask difficult questions. God is more than able to answer and God, I believe, asks no less of us. Because Paul will write to Timothy at the end of his life to say this, even though I'm suffering as I am, I'm in jail, yet there is no cause for shame. For I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Will you be, and I be able to build up over time as we examine the evidences, as we examine the text, as we compare, as we ask, as we seek the Lord together, study the Word of God. You see, it's very important for us that we don't just trust in men. Because the test of it is, if our faith falls apart when someone else lets us down, of or other people, because of what they do, what, or what they say, will affect our walk with God or will discourage us so much that we say we will never trust God again, we won't attend church, we, we will not mix with Christians anymore. We won't study the Bible anymore. Then we know if our attitude and our heart is like that, we are leaning not on the Lord, but we are leaning on the arm of flesh. Let us not fall into that trap. So, continue to examine the Word of God personally. And third, I'll just mention this, that after all that is said and done, we need the Holy Spirit to fill us daily and to convict us in our hearts. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said this, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And true enough, when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, all the disciples went out and shared the good news. So my dear friends, as I close, we must remember that knowing Jesus and the power of, us, of His resurrection gives us confidence in His ability and not on our own. We may not feel very strong, we may not feel very uh, useful, we may, not, we may not feel very powerful at this point in, our, in this season of our life. But it is not about us. It is always about Christ and His resurrection power. So we cannot live our Christian life by our own power and strength. And we must examine, maybe deconstruct a little bit 
and what we have been doing, are we relying so much on our surroundings, our atmosphere, our technology, rather than on God? I pray that you will not stay frustrated. I pray that we will not feel that you are a failure because the power of Christ's resurrection remains on you. So abide in God daily. Remain in Him. Surrender to His power. Allow Him to change you, to mold you, to be the person that He wants you to be. May we not carve God out in our own image. So we may not gather in a physical sense this Easter. Our churches may be empty, As we remain hopeful that this infection will pass us by. But yet, we may also be fearful as we see or hear the news that people die. More than 50,000. Millions. More than 50,000 has died. A million more are now sick. We may not even know whether our loved ones will remain healthy or any of us may die alone in the ventilator. But even as we confront with that fear, We turn to Christ this Easter. And be reminded that Christ has defeated death. So this Easter, our churches may be empty, but the tomb of Christ is also empty. So do not be afraid. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And this is what Jesus said, Because I live, you also will live. And let me close with a quote from David Wilkerson. Faith is not to get you out of a hard place, but it is to change your heart in that hard place. And the world is looking for Christians Disciples who can stand up to every crisis, fear, trouble, and difficulty, and remain calm and at rest in the midst of it all. The world needs to see God's children trusting wholly in their Lord. May God bless you. This is the Sunday. Shall we pray? Father, we come before you and entrust ourselves and our family, our community, our country, and the nations of the world into your mighty hands. Grant us the peace and the faith to overcome our fears. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. your name into the night 
Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadow of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. You're my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his son. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who sets me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain, there's salvation. Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Then came the morning That sealed the promise Your very body Begin to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared a grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Whoa, hallelujah! Praise the one who. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope, hallelujah, praise the one who sets me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Jesus Christ, my living hope Jesus Christ, you're my living Nothing 
by the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus.